2016 has been a great year for FX Medicine. We've celebrated the first anniversary of our dedicated website, fxmedicine.com.au. And we're also very honoured and proud to be the recipients of the Complementary Medicines Australia CMA Award for Most Outstanding Contribution to Research, Education and Training. We love bringing you relevant content which is designed to improve safety and clinical proficiency. We're so very grateful for your continued support and please do let us know what topics you'd like us to cover in the future by dropping us a line on fxmedicine.com.au, Twitter or Facebook. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining me on the line today from, oh, we were going to say sunny, but Christchurch, <laughs> is naturopathic doctor Lara Bryden, who runs a busy hormone clinic in Sydney, Australia. Her book, The Period Repair Manual, provides treatment solutions for polycystic ovarian syndrome, heavy periods, endometriosis, and many other female hormonally related problems. Welcome back to FX Medicine, Lara. Hi, Andrew. Thank you for having me again. Our pleasure. Now, today we're going to be talking about the first condition I mentioned, polycystic ovarian syndrome, often called PCOS or PCOD, polycystic ovarian disease, which I love. <laughs> but I think we need to start off with the difference of th there's women with polycystic ovaries and women with uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, isn't there? Okay. Well, for, yeah, that's a great place to start. Let's talk about that. Um, Polycystic ovaries is not a thing. It's not a disease. It's not a condition. It's it's an ultrasound finding that may or may not be associated with anything. In fact, one study found that um, if you were to, you know, of, of normal women with normal hormones, normal ovary, you know, normal ovarian function, normal everything, if you ultrasound them, mm. um, one out of four, one in four times, they'll show polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. So wow, that often... most, yeah, most experts agree and myself included that, you know, it's not as a standalone finding, it really doesn't mean anything. Yeah. But then there's polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, how is that different and how many women does it affect? It's common. So it's between... Well, the latest is between sort of ten to fifteen percent of you know men's of, of women of reproductive age, and I've seen some studies saying you know up to twenty percent. So it, it's becoming and it's becoming more common I yeah. think, for reasons that we'll talk about today. It's now it's a syndrome. It's interesting that yeah you, you quoted the PCOD or you know polycystic ovarian disease because it doesn't really qualify as a disease no. in that it's. It's a description of symptoms. It's a constellation of symptoms, and it is a what's called an umbrella diagnosis. So it's a, currently a diagnosis that's given to women who have, are, you know, meet the criteria of, of irregular ovulation mm -hmm. and ex excess androgens or male hormones. And they, what, what the research shows now is that they have come to that all of all the different women who meet the, that requirement. They don't all have the same condition. They've potentially, you know, all come to that place, that set of symptoms for different reasons. Mm. So that's very important. It's not one disease. Yeah, it's yeah. A, like uh, my original learning was, oh, it's basically like a, a syndrome that's, you know, very highly associated with cardiovascular disease and pre-diabetes or diabetes. But it's, that's not always the case either. There seems to be this, you know, you've got to qualify for, f what was it, five out of eight types of symptoms. Is that right? There was a certain. Well, it depends on which. Yeah, it depends on which criteria you use. Right. Different groups have come up with different criteria. Gotcha. Um, the one I use, I just quote here, is the National Institutes of Health, the NIH criteria, which just says um, what they're calling oligo ovulation, so irregular ovulation, not regular ovulation. That's a key feature yep. of PCOS, true PCOS, elevated androgens, and then the third criteria is exclusion of other reasons 
Uh, for that, yes. those first two symptoms. Yeah. And the NIH criteria does not include ultrasound <laughs> findings, which is, you know, goes back to my first point. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, but I think importantly also there, it doesn't include this classical apple-shaped obesity because I've seen quite thin-looking look, women um, who have polycystic ovarian syndrome and they might have issues with yeah. hirsutism and, and things like that. For sure. Mm. Yep. So this comes back to what you you mentioned uh, about insulin, the problem with insulin or metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, that underlies, it's an underlying mechanism and sort of an underlying reason for the estimate is about 70% of PCOS. And so on my, in my work, in my book, and on my site, I talk about types of PCOS. I really don't think it's possible to talk about PCOS without acknowledging the different types because yeah. it's not one thing. We just established that. So it, for the majority of true you know, women who meet the PCOS criteria, it's essentially being caused by or you know, insulin resistance is a, is a major underlying factor. Right. And that insulin resistance is, of course, also associated with cardiovascular risk factors. So quite an important feature of the condition. but it, And so often insulin resistance is associated with obesity, but not always. Um, slim women can be insulin resistant. So that's important. It's important to test for insulin resistance and confirm that, whether that exists or not, whether that's happening for the woman or not. And then, but of the group, but then there are other women who have fallen under the umbrella diagnosis of PCOS, but they're not insulin resistant. And in my clinical experience, they actually do require quite a different approach. And, you know, with I think, for example, if, if a slim woman is, is, woman is not insulin resistant, she, she should not be, for example, you know, pursuing the kind of popular low-carb approach to PCOS that, you know, widely discussed online. That might be possibly, you know, the opposite yeah. thing to what she needs. Yeah. Given that you, you've spoken about, insulin resistance being a, a sort of major underlying factor in, I think, did you say 70 odd percent? Is that right? Yes. yes so that, that being the case, you'd be, I'm just going through the si possible signs and symptoms in my mind. And I, I guess part of that would lead to the weight gain, but that's not in all people as we discussed. Do they Correct. eventually yes. move into that pre-diabetic um, body type, or is it just some women just are thinner and they have PCOS? Yeah, I think it's possible. What's something that I've seen clinically? It's possible to have to be insulin resistant and to not be obese, or even not sort of become obese. Um, and you know, as you know, a sort of insulin resistance by definition is is, is kind of a pre-diabetic state so un and, but it's a reversible state so pe patients need to know that you know it's because they've been diagnosed with metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance or prediabetes it doesn't mean they're on the track to diabetes it yeah. can definitely be reversed with you know and, and natural treatments are one of the most effective ways to do that which is why this is the perfect you know topic for Natchez to, to know about and nutritionists to you know work with so when we're talking about these, you know, common signs and symptoms, can we go through a few of them? Because there's more than just these, uh, like, obviously hormonally related things, isn't there? They're, they're like anxiety and there's a whole list yeah. of these symptoms that, that they sort of branch out from the possible reasons for it, like, the you know, the androgenism and things like that. Can we list those for our listeners sure. and then maybe... Um, we'll draw back and, and talk about some of the treatments for these? Sure. Yeah, of course. So the common, the, I guess one of the first symptoms is irregular periods, which is a natural outcome of the irregular ovulation. Yeah. Although some PCOS sufferers can be somewhat regular with their bleeds. Um, I think it's interesting that um, what the research shows now is that women can be bleeding somewhat regularly, but not actually ovulating ah. every cycle or very often. So that's it's worth. I'm always, I'm always asking my patients, you know, figuring out are you actually ovulating with these cycles, you know, and perhaps testing for progesterone to confirm that or looking for signs of ovulation. Yeah. 
And so because the failure to ovulate regularly is obviously why infertility is, is another symptom outcome of PCOS. Um, and then the, it, let's, we'll keep going through the symptoms. So the, 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 the excess male hormone, call, that's the most, often the most distressing part of the condition mm. um, for women is it, so it causes um, acne, or, you know, facial skin breakouts, yep. um, facial, facial hair and body hair. And that can be quite substantial at times. Um, and you won't, you know, often won't see it because women are waxing. But so one of the questions I'll ask is how often do you have to wax, uh, you know, your chin yep. or your face? It's, and it's distressing, you know, so these young women are sort of having to do that, having to wax, you know, a couple of times a week or something. It's, it's, oh, um, certainly if they've got darker it's, hair. It's, it's concerning. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also the elevated male hormones can, um, commonly cause hair loss. So that's another, you know, that's another presenting symptom. Um Beyond that, the the there's a, there's a big, um, abnormal bleeding or heavy bleeding or spotting, and one of the kind of medical risks or one of the things that doctors are often quite concerned about is the because of the failure to ovulate regularly, the uterine lining can grow to be quite thick, mm-hmm. and you know then cause abnormal bleeding, and eventually, like untreated, you know that's a risk. Over many years, yeah. and just to be clear, that that can be a risk for uterine cancer. Yeah, oh, sorry, endometri- not uterine endometrial, endometrial sorry. cancer, and yeah. yeah, so that's what they're the doctors are keeping an eye on that, and then you know sometimes we'll prescribe have to prescribe medication to try to deal with that. But you, you're you're right about the anxiety and um, autoimmune conditions. There does seem to be a sort of a correlation with some of those other symptoms, and it's. Not so clear from the you know pathophysiology of the condition why that is, but certainly there's a in the scientific literature there's an association. Oh look, I think if nothing more than you know things like social isolation and you know issues with acceptance, group acceptance, all of that sort of thing. You know the the pressure that women put on women and media put on women to to be a certain way, and if they're out of that mould, um, you know they're not they don't think well of themselves. And I find this very common of women. Yep. There's such pressure put on women. Yep. It's a distressing condition emotionally, so that, that certainly can affect mood. The other thing I'll say is because they're not ovulating, because women are, with PCOS are not ov- ovulating regularly, they're missing out on the benefits of progesterone, yep. which is an important um, hormone for mood and for modulating immune function. And so I think that's part of, oh, of course. the other. So even yeah. things like sleep? Yeah. Yeah. Can affect sleep. Yeah. Now, one thing that interests me about the hair loss, so uh, forgive me, about the hair growth and loss is, am I right in saying that they're going to mainly get hirsutism around the face, you know, the beard, the 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 mo, the upper lip, um, and get the hair loss like a male pattern baldness type thing or a thinning of the hair? Is that a thinning of the hair on the cap? Is that correct? Okay. So here's what interests me is. If that's the case, has anybody looked into why? <laughs> why do you get, with the same hormone, an increase in hair on the beard and a decrease in hair on the head? Oh, well, it's the same as in men. It's just that those hair follicles are sensitized. That's how they respond to testosterone and androgens. That's just, huh. you know, that's the same in men. You know, that's testosterone will, when testosterone kicks in, you get, you know, a beard and, in some men, you know, eventually. So it's a testosterone that promotes the male pattern baldness. And it is kind of a male pattern, can become a male pattern, like thinning at the front, mm. thinning at the temples, yeah. or yes, on the, just on the, the vert, like on the top of the head. And it's not just facial hair, it's body hair as well. So it'll be, you know, more kind of arms, legs, legs you know, yeah. bikini line. And also the, one of the questions I always ask is, um, along the, like a sort of a line along the lower belly and around nipples. As well, ah, Those are, you know, specific yeah. questions I'll ask clinically that are quite helpful. Yeah. Gotcha. So I, I, it's tweaked something in my brain. I need to learn about why the different follicles act differently to the same hormone. That's something for me to learn. And so, can I just ask? I, I guess that a lot of women would come to you having been through, or at least currently undergoing, medical management. Can we go through the medical management of polycystic ovarian syndrome for our listeners? Absolutely. That's a good place to start. And uh, I'll say that the medical management has improved greatly over the last, because I've been working in, you know, in clinics for the last 
about almost 20 years. And 20 years ago, the medical management was something called ovarian wedge surgery, <laughs> with wedge resection. So, you know, it used to be, and then, and then for many years, it was just hormonal birth control was really the only yeah. management. And so, you know, I've seen that transition from that time when I felt the medical management was so off base to now the more modern approach, certainly, um, you know, the, the approach taken by good endocrinologists and, and good doctors is to look more at the underlying cause of insulin resistance and to you know, diagnose that and to treat that with diet, which is a big step. You know, they're, they're using, I guess, kind of a low GI diet, which I think we could do a bit better than that. But certainly, you know, some attempt to restrict carbohydrates can yep. be helpful. Yep. And the other mainstream management now is a um, diabetes drug called metformin, which sensitizes the body to insulin. And I actually think metformin can be helpful. I think, um, although I will say my experience is that the natural treatment for sensitizing, for insulin sensitizing, I'm going to go out on and say I think is more effective than metformin. But metformin is better than nothing for certain. It's certainly a far, you know, far better option than what women use to receive. Right. The only caution around metformin is it does it does can deplete the body of vitamin B12. So I think it's just crucial actually that women sort of have that monitored or a blood test for B12 after being on metformin. Absolutely. I, I, I think especially if they're going to be using this treatment to improve their fertility, that would be yeah. a, a mandate, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd think so, but it's not always tested. But let's take a minute to talk about um, the folly of using hormonal birth control to treat this condition, yeah, because that that has been a standard treatment for you know for the last twenty years, and it's still even today um, given routinely by by some doctors. And it's not a good treatment. And primarily, one of the, the biggest problems with it is that hormonal birth control, really all almost all types of hormonal birth control, worsens insulin resistance. And right. so they're they're using a treatment to come to shut down ovarian function, which can yes you know does reduce the androgens, but at the same time it's unfortunately worsening the underlying re, you know one of the main underlying reasons for the condition. And then when women come off, they're pushed back; they're worse than they was be- than they were before. Gotcha. So, and that's not just a naturopathic view anymore. They're quite prominent, you know, experts medical experts saying much the same thing. So fortunately, we're hopefully maybe in the big picture leaving hormonal birth control behind. But in the meantime, some patients may still be offered that. And and what about naturopathic treatments? Because I think, you know, this is where natural medicine really shines. In Given that there's this metabolic issue, I would say that this is where naturopathic type and dietary treatment really shines. Am I, am I right there? You are spot on. Yeah. Um, PCOS is one area where naturopathic medicine really shines mm. because we have so much to offer um, offer women. So my approach clinically, as like I said at the beginning, is to I really need to dissect and kind of understand for each individual patient what is going on and, you know, potentially what type of PCOS we're dealing with because other, if, you, if if we just take the diagnosis at face value, just you know PCOS, and just try to treat from there without looking a bit deeper, mm. we can we can go down the wrong track. So my first job as a clinician, the first thing I do is really try to confirm the diagnosis as a real diagnosis, and because there are a lot of women out there, unfortunately, who have been diagnosed by ultrasound, which we determined is not correct, right. not accurate at all. And here's a scenario that I might see quite commonly is a woman comes off hormonal birth control when it's normal to not have a period for some months. You know, anywhere up to 12 months is considered kind of normal, a normal time frame to try to re- to reestablish regular ovulation after hormonal birth control. And so during that time, there often would be pill withdrawal acne, which is a very common symptom, skin problems coming off the pill. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so if, if a woman happens to see her doctor during that time, okay, so the doctor sees she's got no periods or irregular periods, she's got skin problems and ultrasound is like, oh, there's a polycystic ovaries, ov- ovaries. 
insulin never tested, but this, you know, this diagnosis is, is given of PCOS and that can be very confusing. <laughs> and then, you know, I find women then look online and they then go on a low carb diet and they, you know, they just kind of go down the wrong track. Yeah. So that's one of the first things I, I really like to understand. My first question is, is she insulin resistant or not? And that requires the, the best test is the glucose tolerance test with with insulin, with a dynamic insulin test done alongside the glucose. And that will reveal whether insulin resistance exists or not. I sometimes also do use another test called the HOMA, H-O-M-A. Yes. IR um, index. IR, which, yeah. Yeah, which is a ratio of fasting insulin to glucose, which is, you know, it's just a fasting test, so it's a bit easier to do. And uh, you can also look for signs and symptoms of insulin resistance, which includes um, waist measure. So it's actually a ratio between sort of waist measure and height, but also you can, I sometimes just do, you know, if the waist is greater than in a woman sort of 85 or 90 centimeters, then that's highly indicative of insulin resistance. Although we've just said earlier that some slim women, a woman can be slim and still have insulin resistance. So it's not foolproof. Um, there's a kind of discoloration of the skin that happens with insulin resistance, kind of a darkening of the skin under right. the armpit, for example, and at the neckline. Um, and another just little easy thing for detecting or you know assessing insulin resistance, and I'm getting this from this is brilliant PCOS summary by Sydney Professor Warren Kibson, which we can link to in the notes, mm. the 2011 sort of summary that he wrote for Australian Doctor. And it's just really helpful. It's really, really great. Like, you know, we talked about a few things in there that um, I resonated with very strongly. But but one of the tips is using SH, um, something called sex hormone binding globulin. That's a blood test. Yep. And that, that insulin suppresses that. So when insulin is high, as it is chronically in insulin resistance, then SHBG will be low. And so that's just another kind of easy thing to ah. look at. Some of the liver function markers, something called ALT, is elevated with insulin resistance. So there's a whole, you know, picture, Mm. clinical picture that you can look at. I didn't Um, know about sex hormone binding globulin being decreased from increased insulin. That's a really good, nice little little red flag, if you like, for something that's going on. It's really helpful. And he actually, I'm just trying to find... You know, your listeners can look, seek out his article and read that. Mm. And he just kind of gives it. He said he almost goes so far, I think, as to use it kind of as a, almost a surrogate marker. Um, here he says, yeah, SHBG is one of the best laboratory indicators of insulin resistance. Values less than 38 nanomoles per liter are diagnostic of insulin resistance. Wow. So that's very helpful. Yeah. And also, SHBG will improve with treatment. So you can use that to monitor. Um, somewhat, yeah. And and um, sorry, what was that author? Well, because we'll definitely put this link up on the FX Medicine website. His name is Professor Warren Kitson. Warren Kitson from gotcha. Prince of Wales in Sydney. So he's he's really probably one of the international PCOS experts. Um, some of the, really the best people out there, mm. I think, for PCOS. And he and he. Um, he has in this paper that I'm refer- this you know summary that I'm referring to and you know I've heard some of his patients say to me that he does, he thinks hormonal birth control is not a good choice. Probably I think I'm accurate in saying he you know would he would say it's not a good choice for yep. PCOS yeah. <laughs> because of the way it promotes insulin resistance and he talks about that in that this summary. Yeah, and that's often the progestogens that do that, isn't it? The um, madroxy yep. progesterone acetate. Yeah, it's the pro- it's the progestins that do it, and I think it's just the. I think it's also partly that um, the lack of the way hormonal birth control suppresses ovarian function because we need our own estradiol, the you know our best estrogen, to, which is an insulin enhancer, like insulin sensitivity enhancer of insulin sensitivity. Yeah. So estrogen is actually quite quite beneficial. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I just made a point then, and I'd, I'd like to reinforce that point to our listeners, and that is that in the oral contraceptive pill, it does not contain progesterone. It contain, They contain progestogens. So they act like progesterone, but they're not the same chemical structure. So they don't have the same, or they don't have exactly the same actions as progesterone. 
<laughs> and you know, I see this by doctors yes. say this all the time. Yeah, the progesterone's in. No, it's not progesterone's in OCP. No. <laughs> um, it's, it's a it's a very different molecule, and it has a few similar effects to progest. progest the progestins and hormonal birth control have a few similar effects, but they have many differences. Sometimes they have opposite effects. Yeah. And there's actually a blog a blog post a post on my blog called The Crucial Difference Between Progestins and Progesterone. So I agree with you 100% on that. Mm. It, it's, it's annoyed me for years, you know, when you look at the, the insulin resistance caused by the OCP in some ladies. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So get, moving on to hormonal treatments, I mean, it's really interesting that now we're seeing even in the scientific literature that, you know, there's there's a real call for for – confirmation of the of the actions um, because even like Alan I think Alan Ben Susan wrote a paper um, saying look there seems to really be some good action here from mainly herbs um, at least what they looked at and so we really need to look at these findings and, and confirm them can we go through some of those major uh, medicines that you use natural medicines that you use and talk about how they work with women with polycystic ovarian syndrome? Yeah, let's go through kind of a short list, not so short, but a list of natural treatments that help to improve insulin sensitivity and therefore can dramatically improve PCOS in in the you know the insulin resistant type of PCOS. So the first thing is not a not yet a medicine, but I'll, you know, it's a diet change, yeah. which I just really have to enforce, which is to reduce fructose in the diet. Mm-hmm. So I'm in the camp that thinks, you know, I'm convinced from the lit- current literature that high con- you know, concentrated high dose fructose, whether it's from table sugar or, you know, high fructose corn syrup or even honey or dates or agave or all the fructose sweeteners, yeah. that that impairs insulin sensitivity. It impairs it. leptin, another hormone called leptin. And it, my clinical experience is that to remove Dramatically remove, reduce fructose in the diet can is a game changer for insulin resistance. So, so, so can I, can I ask that one? Yep. How much yep. do you have to reduce? Like, if somebody's having, say, four cups of coffee a day with two sugars in each cup, is that too much? That's too much. Right. I think so. I said whenever as soon as I say fructose, the first question I get from my patients is, "Oh, do you mean fruit?" So, I mean. You know, I think you know one or two pieces of whole fruit in a day is is a reasonable thing for someone even with insulin resistance. But no concentrated fruit, like no fruit juice, no dried fruit, no sugar, no honey, mm. and that and there's all the hidden sugars too, like in sweetened yogurts and muesli bars. And, That's you know, a real trick. And, yeah. That's a real trick. I, I'm going to go so far as to say the natural medicines will not work. Unless, you know, someone can also give up fructose. Like, yeah. it, it's, that, it's that critical. Yeah. And you go and through this in your book, right? Yes. I talk about sugar in my book. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be forever because that's a hard call, especially for someone who might be addicted to sugar, which I think, you know, is real. Or, <laughs> yeah. um, that can be quite a frightening idea to give it up. So I try to give a lot of support, nutritional support to reduce cravings and just, you know, people need emotional support they need to, mm. to make this change. It's not as easy as it sounds. And then, but insulin resistance is reversible. So once they regain some insulin sensitivity, then I think it's reasonable for people to, you know, start having some amount of honey and you know, having some of that, that back in their diet to a moderate degree. So yeah. it's, yeah, it's not a life sentence. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's the first thing. And also the insulin um, sensitivity is improved quite a lot by the timing of protein. So having, you know, protein in the morning yes. can really help. Fasting overnight, you know, I, I'm a big fan of not snacking after dinner, like having the dinner and then that, that's it. Um, even some degree of, depending on the woman and whether it's suitable, pos- you know, some degree of inter- something called intermittent fasting can be yep. Helpful. I use that in my practice. So is this and kind of like the five-two yeah. diet, that sort of thing? Yeah, and I think I, this, I, women often need a gentler, sort of different version than men. Yeah, because of our way our stress hormones are calibrated, and so I one like one simple thing. There's also many different types of intermittent fasting, mm. but one example of something that a lot of my patients quite like is something called the eight-hour eating window. 
So but, eating between oh, yes. only within kind of an eight hour time frame during the middle of the day, like yes. ten to six or something like that. Yeah. Um, it's it's simple and it's usually quite doable and that so that can be helpful. Yeah. Um exercise is also very helpful. And that's in agreement, everybody's in agreement, you yeah. know, natural therapists and mainstream therapists. Absolutely. It it's sensitized to insulin. Yeah. Is is there any particular exercises though? I, like I, I seem to recall um Dr. Mark Houston, um, who's a cardiologist. Um, saying that everybody does the cardio first and then the strength, and he says no. He says do the strength first and then the cardio. Yeah, and I'm like, oh. I would <laughs> well, my understanding of insulin sensitivity, yeah, it's, it's where you where you regain insulin sensitivity is in the muscle. Yeah, so certainly building some muscle mm-hmm. and tone of like you know strengthening muscle, yes, can be very very. So I would I would agree with that. Right, that makes sense. To oh, me. cool. Yep. Um. Okay, so those are the that's the baseline. Yeah. But then, what we can what I can do now is just speak through you know some of the supplements that I find most helpful, um, and that there is quite a m- amount of literature, you know, scientific literature support for. I think almost all of these things I'm going to talk about now. So depending on well, I know you like to include some references at the end of your podcast, but yes. it would be literally dozens of things. Like there's quite a bit of research on these. That's okay. So I there's can kind of, space on I the website. Out, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, one of the best ones is magnesium, which I call, I refer to as the, the natural metformin. Like it's, it's highly, it sensitizes the insulin quite strongly. And magnesium has lots of other benefits because it reduces, you know, it helps to modulate normalized stress hormones. So it's quite calming and feel good and it can help reduce sugar cravings and help with sleep, with, which helps reduce sugar cravings. So as my patients can tell you, I prescribe magnesium for almost, well, almost every person with PCOS, really, or insulin resistant PCOS. Mm-hmm. It's extremely helpful. And it's not very expensive. So it's a very good starting place. Um, and after that, then I think one of the next ones is lipoic acid, which, alpha lipoic acid, which sensitizes to insulin. And in fact, in Europe, it's you know, pres- is a prescription, like as a medicine for, you know, diabetes and yeah. diabetes. Like it, it, it's, there's a lot of research around that. And, and yet, it, it yet, is helpful. And yet, yeah. you know what? I yeah. Like it's an obvious one. The research is on, uh, you know, preventing diabetic complications. And yet I would have never chosen that in my, in my ah. uh, repertoire. And yet it's an obvious one. Yeah. So that's a, that's yeah, a good little great. wake up call. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great one. The next one is um, vitamin D, if deficient. And in Dr. Professor Kidson's little summary that I referred to before, he talks about how common vitamin D deficiency yes. is in PCOS. And I, I think it, it's a, it often goes hand in hand with insulin resistance. So correcting vitamin D deficiency can it can induce ovulation. I've seen it. it it's very helpful. Huh. And but but I'm not in the camp of I don't go really high with the doses because yeah. I think I try to stay in the kind of you know two thousand units a day range because there are times yes when even you know you give vitamin D and the blood test doesn't improve but some of that's to do with the inflammatory the, sort of the nature of the condition itself I think that that low D can what we're seeing now is possibly be a symptom of the insulin resistance and not just D deficiency. So mm. I don't like, I'm just giving a caution. I don't like women to take like, you know, 50,000 units or what some people are doing for, I don't think that's necessary. Oh, that's, that's so, really high. But I, I do yeah. recall a Michael Hollick saying that obese people, uh, you know, if they're a polycystic ovarian syndrome sufferer that, that has the apple shaped obesity, um, that o- obese people, um, the vitamin D basically gets sequestered in the fatty layers of the skin. Or the, forgive me, the seven yeah. dehydrocholesterol gets sequestered so that it can't change into vitamin D. So he advocates that obese people take three to five times as much as other people. So if we're talking about two thousand units, that could be six thousand odd units per day to sort of start to see a shift. And I don't see that as being an issue, um, at least not short term. I remember Reinhold Veith talking about, um, you know, ten thousand IU per day won't basically land you in court um you know the, 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 you know he basically says um you know if, if there's any not remembering his quote but it says um if there's basically any ad- adverse outcomes from taking 10,000 IU I have yet to find it 
and that was an older uh, a paper of his. But so you tend yeah, to go on yeah. the lower end of the spectrum and get in what natural sunlight. Yeah, you are right about actually obesity does tend to cause a lower D state, and I think it is partly yeah it's a, it's a problem with the they're not getting the benefits of the sun activation from the skin. Um, yeah, look, I, I'm, I'm not going to go on record as a you know an absolute maximum limit. I think yeah, I think it's reasonable to go up to five thousand per day over you know short term and being monitored. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some women I, might I think the more. thing is short short term and then bring it down. Um, yeah. Like I don't, I seriously don't see an issue with five thousand. I you Jenny, um, Dr. Jenny Gunton of Westmead um, Hospital found was using five thousand IU per day in uh, pre-diabetic or diabetic women, uh, pregnant women. I think it was actually um, because they were so deficient in vitamin D. Yeah, but but that's a certain subset. Yeah. Of the population, yeah. but look, I'm taking away from your thing anyway. So, so you no. tend to go smaller doses, and do you measure or do you just dose? I do measure. Well, I do measure. I, I like to see if there's a deficiency, but I don't. I guess what I'm saying is, give it even if you're you know giving say five thousand units a day, and it's not coming up on serum. There could be different reasons for that, and it might not just mean that they just need more. Yeah. You know, it might be that they're they're sequestering the D and other compartments, you know, other types of vitamin D that you're not measuring. And I just think there's a, you know, some caution around just dosing and dosing and dosing. Yes. But yes. Oh, all absolutely. that said, vitamin D, all, vitamin D is very helpful for PCOS because it improves insulin sensitivity and it also sensitizes the, over, like it helps promote ovulation directly. So it's wow. yeah, quite important. Yeah. And so um, can I yeah. ask, just forgive me for harping on about this. So do you see yeah. like, uh, I'm not going to use the word magical, but do you see quite quick results with that? Or is it something that's, you know, really a slow haul to see it results? Depends. With I, I, when I've seen quick results, I'm just thinking of the patient group, you know, so it's certainly someone who's been very deficient and is perhaps doesn't have a lot, like isn't, it's maybe less insulin resistant or it, it's not sort of, it doesn't need to be a lot of things, other things going on, but yet they're not ovulating. Certainly, I've seen sometimes giving a correction that D deficiency can bring on ovulation quite quickly, like within a couple months. So that wow. I hate. To, I always like to look for it clinically because I hate to miss that. Like that would be such a simple yeah. solution. So yeah. So there's vitamin D. Um, the next one's um, so it's very popular. Now we're getting into the territory of herbal medicine. Is berberine. Which is a ah, yes. the active and because you're you're a herbalist, aren't you, Andrew? Or I'm um, a nurse. I'm I still oh, haven't yeah. finished my naturopathy. Okay. <laughs> Started in 1997. Right. <laughs> okay, so it's the active constituent. It's one of the constituents of a number of different herbs, including golden seal and philodendron, and um, it has some very interesting properties. And it's gone head to head against metformin in a number of clinical trials. And outperforms metformin. <laughs> Whoa! So it's yeah, in terms of improving insulin sensitivity, promoting pregnant, you know, fertility, success in fertility treatments. So it's it's a big player. It's a, you know, it's a high flyer now in PCO, natural PCOS treatments. Quite popular. Now, um, sorry to yeah. jump in, but are we talking berberine, the extract from the herb, or are we talking about herbs which contain berberine? Well, potentially both. The clinical trials have been done on berberine, the extract, mm -hmm. and sometimes I do recommend that, use that with my patients. But um, I had a combination conversation with a herbalist on my Facebook page the other day. She uses a philodendron, yep. straight philodendron, which, and she, you know gets similar results. So I think the berberine containing, the whole herb containing berberine can be helpful as well. Yeah, um, it, has a, it has a number of different mechanisms, but... Yeah, it's it has quite a strongly insulin sensitizing effect. It's anti-inflammatory. So, but it's just for your listeners. Berberine does require a bit of thought, or preferably some supervision professionally, because it it's not it, it you know it's a reasonably safe herb, but it has some precautions. Like it um, can interact with other medications and change the doses of other medications. You know, some psychiatric medications. So it's you know if your doctor. If you're on other medications, you need to think this through and yes. speak to somebody about it. Yeah. And also, it's not safe during pregnancy. So it it can be used, my opinion is it can be used, carefully used, you know, in 
leading up to pregnancy, but if, if you know, some women, some people might stop, choose to stop it in the luteal phase, for example, or post ovulation, just to be sure, or certainly yeah. stop it, be, be um, alert and do your pregnancy test and stop it when pregnant. Mm-hmm. And, all, and also, it it um, upregulates cytochrome P450 enzymes and it, um, you know, affects gut flora. So I can, I'm moving more to kind of pulsing that herb, not doing it continuous dosing every day, but maybe doing it for you know, 10 days on or four days off or some weeks on and some weeks off just to it, use it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And there are, and then there are literally <laughs> dozens of other <laughs> things potentially that can improve insulin sensitivity. And one of the reasons that so many things help insulin resistance is because it's quite a, if you will, like quite a deep part of our physiology, you know, it's the insulin signaling is happening in the cells and in the mitochondria. So anything that kind of improves cell health or mitochondrial health potentially can improve insulin right. sensitivity. And that includes something called N-acetylcysteine, which is another popular supplement. That, um, uh, that's just finding utility yeah. in so many areas, isn't it? <laughs> like, yeah. Just amazing. It is, yeah. Uh, like yeah. years ago, it was like, oh, yeah, it's an antioxidant. It causes glutathione. No. No, no, no. You know, way more. <laughs> well, yeah. in, in nursing, well, it's a mucolytic, you know, in, in medicine. Well, part, you know. Yeah. It's partly because glutathione affects so many things. That's, mm. that's part of, I think, all the reasons. Yeah. But it has other mechanisms apart from glutathione. So th- those are – I'm going to make sure we've got a bit of time today to talk about other treatments for – potentially for non-insulin resistant PCOS. Yeah. Yes. Because, um, I mean – those ones that we just listed are my front line. Once I've confirmed that someone is insulin resistant, whether they're overweight or not, that's the direction I go. And so all of those things you just talked about. Yeah. But for those kind of smaller number of women that are um, just maybe post pill, not ovulating, but they are showing some high antigens, but not um, not insulin resistant, that it, I, I start to look at you know what type of antigens are elevated. So. What the literature is showing now is that there certainly is a portion of women that under current guidelines kind of meet the criteria for PCOS, but really they're they're dominant in what they've got are um, adrenal androgens Mm -hmm. rather than the ovarian androgens, which adrenal androgens are not, so are not from insulin resistance. So insulin resistance promotes an increase in ovarian androgens um, and a also, you know, decrease in sex hormone binding globulin, so therefore a higher availability of testosterone. But adrenal androgens is kind of a different picture, and I think responds better to things like, well, certainly stress management, reducing stress, yeah. you know, reducing, you know, the HPA axis activation. So that could be meditation and getting more sleep, <laughs> all those things, and magnesium again. But um, also, I, I do use um, a herbal combination of peony and licorice. And so uh, licorice yes. has a yes, so licorice, and again, licorice is a herb that requires some thought because it can elevate blood pressure. Great. You know, it, 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 I was yeah. going to ask you about this pointedly. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's almost you know um, there's some herbal medicines that are almost anyone can use things like turmeric and quite safe, but some herbal medicines require just a bit more care mm. and advice, preferably. And licorice is one of them, but it. It works. It has an androgen lowering effect, and I think it works particularly well for adrenal androgen excess. Right. I just wanted to, I guess, clarify that point on licorice. When you're using, let's say, paeonine licorice, it's the traditional TCM formula. Um, when you're using that, how alert do you have to be for issues with licorice in, say, uh, you know, polycystic ovarian sufferers who have got the apple-shaped obesity, they've got cardiovascular risk, risk factors, increased blood pressure already. How often do you find that that sort of dose, if you like, is an issue? Or do you find that it's when you start to use licorice as a high dose? Like how often do you see issues? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I guess as a clinician, I don't prescribe that formula when there is high blood pressure already. Right. Gotcha. So, I, I would measure blood pressure if someone's blood pressure is already elevated, which is not the majority of PCOS sufferers. But if that's the case, then I choose other things. And usually that metabolic syndrome, insulin resistant type of PCOS, they need all the other things we've just listed before. So if we're talking about these slim 
PCOS sufferers with adrenal androgen excess, they often have low blood pressure, typically clinically, I see. So uh-huh. I, I'd measure their, I'd get a baseline blood pressure and monitor it. You know, I try to remember to, to or ask the patient maybe to check it once a month or something, just to stay on top of it. Yeah. Um, and I don't find in someone who has in like takes it with starts with a normal blood pressure or slightly low blood pressure, I don't find it has a dramatic effect, although I think it's worth monitoring. Yeah. And also it doesn't have to be used every like this comes back to the idea of kind of pulsing herbs, maybe using it for a couple of months and then taking a break. And you know, it um that's another way to I guess modulate that risk of blood pressure, but it's just it's worth checking. Yeah, I, I think I think the biggest thing there is blood pressure is probably the most useful death prevention tool that any practitioner can use in their practice over a lifetime. Hmm. <laughs> Monitoring blood pressure, yeah. and yeah. I think you know doctors should be doing it every single time a patient, certainly an older patient, comes into their practice. They don't. They just don't have time. And I think as natural practitioners, we have that time. Um, yeah. So I, I just think it's so simple. It's just so simple. You can have a chat while you're doing it. It's it's just, and it's so important. It's so easy to do. Yeah. Well, can I ask, what about one of my old favorites that it's not used nowadays very much because of its expense? It's hard to grow. It's hard to procure. And it, it's, it's a costly herb, and that is false unicorn. Yeah, I don't. I have a lot of experience prescribing that herb, actually. Mm. Um, I think that they're just perhaps my sort of particular training in Canada wasn't one of the herbs. I know it's commonly prescribed in Australia, but I don't, I don't want to – I don't feel qualified to speak about it because it's not one of my yeah. common prescriptions. And and what then about, um, you know, some of these other herbs like – actually, the balancer, the, the old balancer herb, um, but, um, Vitex. How often oh. do you use Vitex? That is a very good question <laughs> because I'm going to go on record here and say that I think Vitex can be a problem for PCOS. Yeah, sure. And so I love Vitex and I prescribe it frequently for, I mainly use it for TNS yep. and for say per- perimenopause when ovulation is becoming less frequent and for another condition called hypothalamic amenorrhea with, you know, um, difficulty ovulating regularly. So it's it's a mainstay for me, but I'm very cautious with PCOS because I have seen it aggravate the condition. Right. And I think the mechanism is that it, I think the problem with it might be that it elevates a hormone called LH. And LH is a, is a pituitary hormone that in classic PCOS is chronically elevated already. So it yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm very careful. I, it's not my first choice. For mm. PCOS, put it that way. No, that's yeah. that's good. That's good salient advice. And what other sort of yeah. things do you use as well? Well, one of the things I want to make sure we talk about is zinc, because oh, yes. it's a natural, and it's an androgen. It reduces androgens. It's an and it, um, also, I think, it has a, a blocking effect at the androgen receptors. It promotes ovulation, <laughs> so it helps, and it also helps with symptoms like you know, acne and it's good for hair. And so zinc is in my book, I talk in my, the PCOS chapter in my book, chapter seven, I talk about zinc being kind of the all rounder, very potentially very helpful for PCOS and quite safe to use. I, I do try to fairly routinely measure zinc and zinc is deficient in a number of women. It's deficient for a couple of reasons. Well, one is it's depleted by hormonal birth control. So straight away, anyone who's been on hormonal birth control, even if they've now stopped it, I have to. You have to consider zinc deficiency, um, and also it's it's primarily obtained through um, red meat and animal products. And some, you know, many of my women patients are, for various reasons, reluctant or have been avoiding reducing meat, yeah. and so they're, in my view, at risk for zinc deficiency. So it's a simple one too. And it's one of those ones where I would hate to miss it. You know, if, if, if a woman's zinc deficient, if she doesn't, until she corrects that, none of the other things are going to work. Mm. It's one of those foundational minerals, isn't it? Zinc, B6, magnesium. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just... yeah. We talked about this in our last <laughs> yeah. podcast, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's it, true. And it, like sometimes I used to prescribe, and I've got to say, it was mainly men who would uptake this and, and oysters. Um, like there's a yeah. corrective dose of zinc in oysters, um, but it's True. mainly men that will eat them. 
Um, oh, I love oysters. But yeah, oh, there I you go. You. Oh, you've just thrown that <laughs> <Yeah>. one out. <laughs> um, see, I'm not. I'm, I can only eat them a certain way. But anyway, um, mm. yeah, it was. I just found it interesting that it was mainly men that would uptake that that consideration. They go, thanks mm-hmm. very much. I'll take the pepitas and the yeah. zito- things supplement. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> what about safety issues with using minerals? I guess especially in the I guess just being cautious about people with cardiovascular risk factors and they may be heading towards things like renal disease if they've got hypertension or something like that. Do you find that there's a real issue or what do you monitor to make sure that you're doing safe practice? Well, renal disease is the primary contraindication for magnesium because that's sort of the one situation where the body cannot easily clear magnesium. Yeah. So... With someone with confirmed renal disease, I probably would not prescribe it, except you know, in consultation with the specialist. But um, for everybody else, it's very safe. Magnesium is incredibly safe. The one complaint is that it can um, cause loose bowel. Yeah, it's an osmotic laxative that draws water into the bowel. So depending on the type of magnesium, some types of magnesium are gentler for the bowel than others, and also you can space out the dosing during the day. But it's it's very safe because the body just dumps it. And also one of the reasons so many of us are deficient in magnesium is because we dump it during stress. The body actively removes it. Yeah. So that's why all of us, you know, working and commuting and drinking coffee and we need more magnesium probably than our ancestors did. Um, so that's magnesium. And the safety around zinc, I, I just try to monitor it. So maybe after three or six months on zinc, check it again. And you can check it in combination with a copper balance because zinc and copper yeah. Um, compete against each other. So the, the potential risk of excess zinc consumption is a copper, inducing a copper deficiency. Yeah. But like e- e- even unusual. zinc, like, uh, like I've used quite high doses short term, and then you just make sure that you're not doing it for too long, you know, being silly and, and causing an adverse, um, uh, sorry, an inadvertent um, copper deficiency and leading down the, the path of cardiomyopathy. Um but, you know, even things like 100-odd milligrams per day in broken-up doses, I've used that in certain situations. But do you, would you have to go that high in polycystic? I don't go that high. But short term, I think that would be okay to do that. I, yeah. I typically go in the 30 to 40 milligram yeah. range. And one thing to say is the most common side effect of zinc is that on an empty stomach, if oh, too yeah. high dose, it will, it will cause nausea. Yeah. So you need to advise your patient about that. You don't want them get it because it can be quite unpleasant mm. to get that sick. So it's short lived, but so you always after food and maybe start at a lower dose just to make sure their stomach is tolerating it. Yeah. And what about B6? How high have you gone with that? There, there seems to be the sort of, um, oh, don't use high doses of B6 because it'll cause paresthesia. And, and yet um, it can be used to treat certain types of paresthesia. Um, but there seems to be a sort of, you know, the adverse reactions that are noted in the literature are quite rare. How often do you see adverse issues with B6? Well, I've never personally seen that happen, I know, but I know it's real. Um, I guess I, I tend, to, tend to stay quite low. So I use activated B6, the pyridoxal 5-phosphate, and I would stay... Like, I don't usually go more than put a 60 or 90 milligrams a day and maybe short term. I use B6 primarily for PMS yep. treatment. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's, it's reasonably safe, yeah. So we've gone through the major herbs, the nutritional supplements, indeed some of the nutraceuticals like NAC. Any other supplements that uh, you use commonly in PCOS and um, any other thoughts on the responsible treatment of polycystic ovarian syndrome? Okay, yeah. Well, one other, I'm just thinking of symptom relief, because of course I like my patients to feel better and they're usually most concerned about their skin and their hair loss and they're wanting something to work quickly while they're working on some of the underlying conditions. So one of the supplements I'm recommending more these days um, is something called DIM or methane, which is an extract from cruciferous, which is a natural androgen blocker. Mm. So it's quite Famous for being an, um, the promoting healthy estrogen detoxification, but it has another effect of being an androgen blocker, and it's extremely popular, and it's you know quite it's safe. So that's another just consideration. Yeah. And in closing, I'll just say again to clinicians or you know patients listening, just to try to don't take your PCOS diagnosis at face value. That's my final advice. Really try to understand 
which, for first of all, if you're insulin resistant or not, which androgens are elevated, whether it's ovarian androgens or adrenal androgens, and try to get it. That'll help you get a better understanding of the, on some of the underlying mechanisms in your type of PCOS. And for more information about types of PCOS, you can see my book or my blog or some other yeah, podcasts yeah. that I've done about types of PCOS. And that's a beautiful segue, Lara, because I was just about to mention your your website. So, um, listeners, if you want to access Lara's book, um, go to larabryden.com. That's L-A-R-A. B R I D E N dot com, and you can access Lara's book and also obviously post on the blog there as prakis. So, Lara, thank you so much once again for taking us through. I mean, this can be quite a complex condition, and I think you've covered the the important foundations in both the diet, the exercise, and the herbs and nutrients that um, practitioners can use to help these women with PCOS. So, I thank you so much for joining us on FX Medicine today. Oh, and thank you, Andrew, for having me. It's um... I just want to put the call out to all the clinicians out there just just to encourage you how much good work you can do for the women with PCOS that need your help. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. FX Medicine is your gateway to news, resources and information on the safe, evidence-based approach to practising complementary and integrative medicine. Visit fxmedicine.com.au to sign up for e-news and stay up to date with the latest research, podcasts and industry information.